Investing can make you tons of money, but why then is there so many people who fail or just don't beat the market? Well, it's because they get horrible advice, leading them to invest in terrible stocks that they don't know anything about. So how do you become good at this game? Well, about a year back, I created an investing strategy, which now have made me plus 100% return on a few stocks. And in this video, I will simplify the strategy so even beginners can understand it. Now there's five crucial steps and each step rely on one another. So it's important that you understand all five. Now the first step most people tend to overlook when looking for good businesses, it's the return on investment capital. But what is this? Return on investment capital is a calculation used to assess a company's efficiency at allocating the capital under its control. So basically return on investment capital tells us how good a company is at making money from the money it uses to run its business. For example, if a toy company spends $100 to make toys and sells them for $150, the return on investment capital is 50%. This means they made a 50% profit on their investment. Now, why is this so important? Well, if a business has a higher return on investment capital, which is usually above 15%, it shows that the company is effective at investing its capital. And it also gives the company the opportunity to reinvest into growth opportunities, such as new products, projects, or expansion, further enhancing its value. Lastly, a high return on investment capital also gives a company a competitive advantage, which I will get into later in this video. Now, just so you guys know that this is actually an important thing to look at when it comes to investing, here's the list of value investors which actually uses this concept. Now, the second concept is also what most value investors tend to look at because it gives multi-bagger potential, and it is share buybacks. But what is this? Well, share buybacks is when a company buybacks its own shares from the stock market. This can make the remaining shares more valuable because there are fewer of them. For example, if a candy company has 100 shares and it buybacks 10 of them, there are now only 90 shares left. This can increase each share's value for the owners. And that's why we like share buybacks, because it gives tremendous value to the shareholders. But it's not every time that we want a company to buy back its own shares. For example, let's say that Apple stock is at $190 per share. And in my opinion, the fair value for the company is $130 per share. Then Apple stock is overvalued. And in this case, we don't want to see the company buy back shares, as the shares are expensive. So instead of the company wasting its money on overvalued shares, they should rather invest back into the business, as it would bring more value over time. But there's one more scenario where a company should not buy back its shares. And that is where the company have a lot of growth potential then the company should rather use the money to invest back into the business instead of buying back shares. So for both scenarios, we just want to see the company reinvest into themselves. Moving over to the third step, that's why we really have to pay attention. Because the company's future growth could be at stake. Now let's say that I were to invest into a company which was within the tech industry. And this company was worth around $100 billion. And the combined tech industry was worth $300 billion. That means the company owns around one third of the market share, which is a huge problem because if the industry only grows around 6% a year, that's basically what we could expect for this company. As when you own a large share of the overall market, then it is hard to take away competition's market share or just expand more than the estimated industry's growth. So we want to look at companies which is within a growing industry and doesn't own a too large portion of the overall market share as then there's opportunity for the company to take over the competition's market share and grow that way. But this doesn't mean we should disclosure all the big undervalued companies, which own a big portion of the overall market share within a slow growing industry, as if they have a lot of competitive advantages, which I will get into later in the video, then there's still growth of potential for that company to even beat the market's annual return of around 10%. But if you want to look for those 10 to 100 bagger companies, then it is a good idea to look for small companies in growing industries. This fourth step can really become a game changer if understand it correctly, and it is the debt. Now, this is a pretty simple topic, but most people tend to overlook it when looking at companies. So for companies to operate successfully through hard economic times, we don't want it to have a lot of debt, as then it could possibly go under when there's high interest rates. But how do we know if a company has a lot of debt? 
Well, it's typically when it has a debt to free cash flow ratio above five, which means it takes five years for the company to pay back its debt with free cash flow. And if a company has a free cash flow to debt ratio under five, then it is pretty good. But it also depends on the industry, as some industries has more debt than others. And that's where you should look at the industry's average debt to free cash flow ratio and compare it to the company. Now, this last fifth step is what most value investors consider as the most important concept within investing, and it is the moat. Now, a moat is basically a business ability to maintain competitive advantages over its competitors in order to protect its long-term profits and market share. So in simple terms, a moat is like a special shield for a business. It helps keep other companies from taking away its customers. Just like a castle has a moat to protect it, businesses with a strong moat can keep making money over long periods of time. For example, when people really love a brand, it makes it hard for new brands to compete. And what really makes a moat great is the competitive advantages, which there is a few to make a business stand out. The first is brand recognition. And that's basically how familiar people are with a company's name or logo. For example, when you see the golden arches of McDonald's, you think of burgers and fries. This familiarity helps companies attract customers and sell more products. The next thing is the return on investment capital. And return on investment capital acts like a moat because it shows how effectively a company uses its money to generate profits. A high return on investment capital means the company makes more money from its investments than its competitors, making it hard for others to catch up. This efficiency helps protect its market share and long-term success. The last thing is the financial help. And financial health means a company manages its debt well, earns more money than it spends, and has enough cash for daily operations and future growth. And the reason this defines a strong mode is because it shows that a company doesn't have a lot of debt, which provides the company with greater financial stability and flexibility compared to its competitors. Also, a higher profit margin is good because it shows a company's ability to make good profits from each sale, giving it an edge over competitors. For example, imagine you sell lemonade for $2 per cup, and it costs you 50 cents to make it. Your profit is $1.50. To find the profit margin, divide the profit by the price. So $1.50 divided by $2 times 100, and that gives 75%. This means you keep 75% of what you earned as profit. This kind of profitability allows the company to invest in growth and maintain stable prices. Strong profit margins also create barriers for other companies trying to enter the market. That was it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. But if you want to learn more about investing, you can watch my video right here where I explain how I earned 200% on my first stock within a year.